There we go. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. Rock and roll. Okay, sounds good. Well, uh, thank you, Travis and uh, Kyle. That was great. A lot of good information in there. Um, like Travis said, my name is Skip Anderson. I'm the shepherd at North Dakota State University. I've been here 11 years and have been working with our, our students and our researchers and our faculty on uh, moving our sheep program forward here. So um, what we're going to uh, discuss this evening a little bit when it comes to young lamb care. And I'm pretty confident that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are going to um, work in a goat situation as well. I think um, we can apply that information uh, back and forth as we go through this. So what, uh, as we get started here. So when it comes to, to lamb health, I like to use this quote, and I actually use this with my students on a uh, regular basis, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And many times when we think about taking care of those young lambs or those lambs that have just been born, um, we can head off so many problems just with sound management off the bat. Um, making sure that our facilities are in order, um, making sure that we as shepherds have a keen eye and that we're picking up on things and looking at um, some of those animals that might not be right or some animals that might need a little extra, extra attention. And the quicker that we can get on top of those things, uh, we can really head off uh, some major problems going down the road. So what I hope to visit with a little bit about tonight here, um, I think we got about 20 minutes in this segment, is um, I want to first talk about environment and facilities, and then we'll jump into some things to watch for. Um, try to sharpen your eye on what are some of those things that you need to pick up on as a shepherd where some of those problems might be um, out there and hopefully catch those things early in advance. Um, then we'll go through a few supply items that you should maybe keep around. Uh, some of these are going to be items that you're going to need all the time, but also items that you should maybe have in your vet kit, but hope that you never have to use. And then we'll uh, jump in with a little bit of a question and, and wrap up as we move forward here. So the first uh, one I, I just want to hit on right off the bat is lamb health starts with the environment that they live in. And here in the last uh, 10 days, us in the upper Midwest have been smacked with some of the most challenging environments to be around in terms of uh, just cold temperatures, wind, um, lots of challenges that uh, really, really made things uh, tough for us as shepherds. But the first thing that um, an old stockman had once told me is, uh, you've got to start with the best bedding that you can get available. Um, bedding makes a big difference. When you're um, refreshing those pens, when you're starting down with a good base of bedding, whether that be straw or maybe uh, shredded corn stalks, or maybe depending on your situation, if you've got um, some wood chips or shavings or something, regardless of what you start with in terms of bedding, you need to make sure that it's clean, it's fresh, and it's dry as much as possible. And I always like to uh, encourage this activity with some of my students and um, was something that I was taught as a young age well, and that's called the kneel test. And when it comes to your bedding, if you can kneel down on your knee and your pant leg comes wet in that spot where you kneel, your bedding is too wet or there's too much moisture around it and you probably need to freshen it up or it needs to be changed. Now that's probably wishful thinking in, in some opportunities where we just don't have the opportunity to clean our pens as routinely, or maybe our bedding supplies are a little bit short and we have to stretch it maybe a few extra days. But um, regardless, when you start putting a, a bunch of moisture into your environment and mixing that with, with your, your lambs and your kids, you're going to start seeing some of those respiratory issues. So that's why I like to always start as the, the footing, the base, the, the bedding is a good place to start. Um, air quality is another one. Um, now here in, in Fargo, North Dakota, our buildings are sealed up pretty tight with our ewes and lambs. Um, we're hitting temperatures of, we were 30 to 40 below zero um, with wind chills where our air temperature was straight up 20 below. It's pretty cold for some of those animals to have to be outside 
a drafty situation. So we have to keep our buildings fairly tight um, to limit some of that uh, cold air blowing in on them. But with that, we also start getting some air quality issues. So if you have the opportunity to crack some of your windows to get some airflow going through your buildings, I highly encourage it. Um, but also if you have exhaust fans that you can run, any way that you can try to reduce um, air, air quality problems, um, lowering those ammonia levels in your barn, um, trying to reduce some of that humidity. I know a lot of us might have pole buildings or uh, steel buildings where they might drip a little bit with some condensation. So we might have to look at maybe some of our insulations that we can use to try to limit some of that or trying to work with some of our air quality systems and, and airflow in order to try to reduce some of that humidity. Now, some of those things are gonna take, uh, have to take an engineer to, to maybe figure that out, but um, a little trial and error on, on opening some of your windows, opening up some of your, your vents in your roof or running your exhaust fans will make a big difference. And the other thing that I always encourage people when we talk about air quality in a building is in order to really test and see what that air quality is like, if it's hard for you to breathe or the, the ammonia is strong, um, when you're standing up, if you're six foot tall, imagine what that's like at lamb level. So I always encourage people to get right down on your hands and knees and put your nose right down there and you take a big whiff of the air. And if it's strong at that level, um, imagine what it's like on that little baby lamb's lungs or that little kid's lungs when um, they're at that level. So I highly encourage that uh, you get right down on lamb level to, to take care of that and check and see what those what that air quality level is like. And then trying to reduce drafts. Now it's a fine line trying to get airflow through your buildings and fresh air, but also trying to reduce drafts when you have um, young lambs or baby lambs in your buildings. So go around your, your pens and look where some of those areas where you might see some daylight coming through, where you might see some of the straw moving. You can even go around with some pieces of uh, like toilet paper or tissue paper and put that right down on the ground. And if it blows in the air, or if it moves, um, you know that you've got some drafty areas. If you can move a lot of your airflow up above the level of the sheep, we still change the quality of the air that's in our buildings, but we're not directly putting some of those drafts right on those young lambs or those young kids. Um, another problem that we, we see, and I kind of grew up with this as a kid was, we had an old stone walled barn that um, when it got really cold, those walls got really, really cold and even were covered some, with some frost. And many times the way our lambing pens are set up in our buildings, we put those against the wall because we want to reduce the number of panels that we really truly need. So we're actually making one side of our lambing jugs up against that cold wall and lambs tend to usually lay up against something and we don't want them laying up against that cold stone wall. So you might want to look at maybe putting some insulation or something or even just plywood along your concrete walls to kind of limit those cold spots in your buildings. And, and hopefully that will ultimately impact the stressors that uh, those lambs have in their environment. And again, the way that we can make lamb health um, go easy for us is to eliminate those stressors. So when it comes down to um, facilities and looking at facilities, um, for lambs to be healthy and lambs to have the right start, so much of that is impacted by the facilities that they're in and the environment that they're in. So if we can check all the boxes on airflow and reduction of humidity and we put clean bedding down, um, that's a really good start. And then we need to start thinking about those facilities and and what are, where are we putting them and what kind of situations we're, we're putting our, our ewes in when it comes to lambing. And then we jump into maybe some mixing pens and then we um, put them into bunching pens or gang pens or whatever you wanna call them where we start putting uh, ewes and lambs and pairs together in, in bigger groups. So just the photos that here um, on the screen, uh, the big picture in the middle is, is part of the lambing room at the NDSU sheep unit. And, our lambing pens are the four by five wooden panels that um, have kind of been the gold standard for a long time when it comes to uh, lambing sheep. They work great. 
Um, in my personal opinion, they might be a little bit small. So really examine how big your ewes are, what breeds of sheep you have. If you're running some bigger frame hamps or Columbia's or Suffolk ewes, a four by five jug probably isn't very big for some of those ewes. They're gonna be touching corner to corner. But if you got some smaller frame dorsets or polypay type ewes, um, those size jugs really truly work. And the whole reason we talk about lambing, lambing jug size is that's where the lamb is going to be penned for the first few days of its life. And that's where the most critical time in that lamb's life is gonna be started. Once we get them past that three day window, um, he stands a pretty good chance at surviving. And so much of our issues can happen right there in the lambing jug. Um, I highly recommend every time you go through and, and move a U out of a lambing jug, you put fresh bedding down, clean out the existing bedding that's in there. Um, if you've got a concrete floor, try to scrape that concrete floor, put down some barn lime after um, each U that goes through that. If you've got a, a dirt floor or a pea gravel floor, I still highly recommend trying to clean out as much as the old bedding or the old straw. And I know that when ewes get lambing, they uh, start doing it in a big group and they don't tend to stop. So a lot of times we, we don't get a chance to um, let those jugs sit open for very long. But even if you can let them open for 24 hours, it really makes a difference to let them dry out and really change the environment uh, where those new lambs are gonna be. Um, the other thing is, is putting safety areas in your lambing jugs. And you can see in the upper photo up there, something as simple as a two by four that goes across the back of the jug um, with maybe a heat lamp or even just a, a regular light bulb above it. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a heat lamp where those lambs are attracted to. Um, they'll go lay under that light and even that two by four provides just enough barrier from that U where she can look over and still smell those lambs and that's high enough where those lambs can come out and, and nurse their mothers. So they make commercial ones that are built to go in in lambing pens, or like we said, just a simple board going across allows that little safety zone for your lambs to get away. Um, if you have to use heat lamps in your, in your barn and, and in your lambing areas, um, be extra careful with those. Um, there's nothing worse than a shepherd is visiting with fellow sheep producers and saying that they're, uh, they had a barn fire because of a heat lamp issue or a heat lamp problem. So make sure your cords are put up strong, um, that the ewes can't get to them, that they're cleaned off of dust so we don't have to worry about any kind of fires or any kind of issues that uh, might be involved with, with heat lamps. But they can certainly make a difference in that lamb's life if you're in a situation where your barn is cold and you don't have any additional heat source. Um, taking that edge off and making them just a little bit warmer um, really can make a difference. And again, like we talked before, um, making sure your lambing room or your jug area is free of drafts and, and reduce the humidity and, and that air quality is the best it possibly can be. This is probably uh, the part in um, my, my job as a shepherd that makes me the most nervous is when we start mixing ewes and lambs from the jugs into mixing pens or grouping pens because that's when you get a bunch of ewes that are only used to their lambs and you've got lambs that are confused with who their mom is and and there's times where you get some of those ewes that are a little bit bossy and they uh, will kind of uh, butt those other lambs away that try to nurse them. So I recommend if you've got the space or have the facilities to do it is try to maybe mix them in groups of maybe five to six U's at a time, give them a few days to kind of adjust to being in, in groups and knowing who their mom is and being able to get around and then moving them into bigger pens. Um, starting them in smaller little mixing groups like that also really limits the the chance that a lamb might get lost or a lamb might get um, confused and not be able to find its mother. Um, it's one of those things where it can be a challenging time, especially if you're really busy lambing and you've only got eight or 10 lambing pens and you fill them up each day and those lambs are only 24 hours old or 48 hours old and you've got to move them out of the lambing pens that fast. Um, you might have one that just might fall behind a little bit so as a shepherd, probably 
getting ewes and lambs mixed together is one of the times where you've got to have the sharpest eye, um, ensuring that that uh, lamb is finding its mother, making sure that that ewe is paired up with that lamb and getting them into a, an area where you can watch them a little bit closely. Once they get past that five days, six days, a week old, and you start mixing them up into bigger groups of maybe 25 or 30 ewes and lambs at a time, it, uh, it really makes it a lot easier in terms of feeding and those types of things. But getting to that point, um, you really got to have a sharp eye. Um, probably in that first initial time um, is when we start seeing maybe some of the most lamb injury. Um, sometimes lambs get stepped on in those areas. Um, sometimes they might get butted up against a, a gate or a board by another ewe. So we really have to um, make sure that uh, those lambs are remaining um, safe in those mixing type environments. So then as we jump in with that idea, um, the photos we've got up here, um, giving those lambs a creep area and Kyle touched on um, this quite a bit was um, providing creep areas for those lambs to, to one, um, have a safe place to get away. And by putting a heat lamp or just a regular bulb in your heat lamp in your area, it really attracts those lambs into that creep area. And once they once they get started in there and start going in there, curiosity gets to them. And these really cold nights that we've had here, um, we've got a mixing pen of about 30 ewes and and close to 50 lambs in that group. And I bet about 35 to 40 of those lambs were all grouped up in there together into that creep area. So it uh, one draws them in there for a little bit of safety. Um, they can get in there with a heat lamp and get some a little bit of warmth, but also then it um, you get a little extra warmth when those lambs are cuddled in there together as well. So get that uh, light up in your in your creep area, and it's amazing how fast those lambs will start finding it. If you look at the big picture at the bottom there, you can see the multiple creep pens that we have in, in our facility and trying to get those lambs to, to start using that right away. And, and touching on what Kyle said, the sooner you can get them in there nibbling and eating in that creep feed, the, the quicker they take to feed and the, the better off they, they go. So what are some of those things to um, watch for um, when you're looking at some of these lambs or, or even your kids when you're, when you're working with your does? is are your lambs content? And I know that's a very simple question, but a lot of times um, you really have to study your baby lambs when they're in the, in the uh, lambing jug or when they move into that first mixing pen. Are they alert? Are they active? Are they full? Do they have a full belly? Um, are they sure-footed? Um, you know, after about five, six hours, those little guys should be able to get around relatively pretty quick. And um, do they seem relaxed? And if all those, if your lambs kind of check all those boxes, they really have a good uh, start to them. Um, one thing I always say is no noise is a good thing when it comes from a, from a baby lamb in the lambing jug. Many times when you hear a lamb that's very vocal or you hear a lamb that is really bawling a bunch, really is the telltale sign that that lamb is hungry. And that lamb will tell you right off the bat when it's hungry or when it's not getting um, enough milk from its mother. And that should flip a switch in your mind that says, hey, I need to intervene before something happens. Um, also, if you happen to walk through your lambing pens and you see those lambs constantly nursing, you look in lambing pen number five and every time you look at it, those two lambs are just really aggressively nursing. So you say, oh man, those lambs are active, they're up, they're nursing, but why are they always nursing? Probably because they're hungry as well. Um, and again, that's an early telltale sign that you can pick up that a lamb might be struggling is by how much activity you're seeing out of them off the bat. When you start seeing lambs that are a little bit hunched up or a little bit cold or a little bit sucked up and, and look a little bit lethargic, we're almost past that point of, of um, where we're catching the problem and we're already seeing a problem set in before we get to that. So listen with your ears and try to hear those lambs if they're vocal and then also watch some of their activity and how they look. The other part that uh, um, I always tell my students is 
put your finger in your lamb's mouth or in your goat's mouth. And if it's warm, it's certainly a good sign. If it's cold or if it's a really wet, watery mouth, then we've got a problem and we've got some other issues that we need to tend to. But a lamb with a full belly and a warm mouth is a pretty telltale sign that we've got a healthy baby. Once we start seeing something different than that, we as shepherds need to intervene. The other part you've got to watch is, is respiratory issues in these sheep or in these lambs is lambs that are maybe breathing a little bit quick or lambs that might have a little bit of, of a rasp to their breathing. They sound like they're labored breathing or they're just a little bit rattly. Um, you can even pick up a lamb and just lay your ear on its, on its rib cage and listen to it breathe. And, and if you hear a lamb that's a little bit rattly or has a little bit of a problem, we know we're gonna have to intervene with, with some uh, antibiotics in terms of pneumonia um, treatment and try to get that lamb turned around. Also look at the manure. Um, the backside of a lamb that is getting plenty of milk is going to have some yellow pasty manure in the first couple days, which is perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine. Um, in my honest opinion, I think a lamb that's got a little bit of manure behind it when he's a day old or two days old is a good thing because we know that that ewe is producing milk and really pumping it through that lamb. It's the ones that when we get into maybe that day three, day four, and that lamb is a lo looking a little bit hollow and sucked up, and that manure is really runny and really yellow and uh, slimy looking, then uh, we have to make some adjustments when it comes to treating that lamb for some scours and getting some antibiotics on board. Um, the other thing that I always like to encourage with my students and encourage with other producers is any lambs that you have to pull are lambs that you need to watch a little bit closer. Um, you know, lambs that uh, maybe had a little bit difficult birth, didn't get started quite as, as strong as we'd hoped to. Um, lambs that come backwards or lambs that have, uh, are born with a dystocia uh, type issue. Those are ones we've got to watch a little bit closer. Um, lambs that uh, we have to pull, we sometimes might see some cracked ribs or broken ribs that need to be tended to. Um, so anything that kind of happens in a very unnatural kind of way should probably be on our radar when it comes to getting that lamb started off right. Um, especially lambs that we had to pull from a breach situation or a backward situation. You think of when a lamb comes normal that rib cage condenses down and that lamb just squirts right out. But uh, when you think of a lamb coming out backwards, that rib cage isn't sinking down nearly as much and it's kind of going against the grain of the natural body of that you and her pelvis. So we got to watch a little bit of that, that rib cage injury on those lambs that we have to pull. So the other thing that um, are really telltale signs in a lamb that uh, maybe just isn't quite um, starting off right is how does a lamb stand or how does a lamb lay down? Um, you can see the picture of the lamb in the middle. I actually took this photo here today at the NDSU sheep unit. This is a lamb that I have tried to help. We have, um, he's a little bit older. He's about three weeks old. We've tried to bottle this lamb, tried to get him um, started and he's probably getting just enough nourishment from his mother that he's stubborn enough that he doesn't want to take a bottle or take some um, intervention on him, but he doesn't necessarily look like he's thriving in any way, shape, or form. Um, to me, that's a telltale sign that that lamb is, is a little bit cold. Um, he's uh, struggling just a little bit. He's maybe not as bloomy as we like to see. Um, so if you're starting to see a bunch of lambs that look like, like that in the middle, um, you need to maybe sh make sure that you're diving in a little bit quicker and trying to get those lambs turned around or a situation where one of the lambs and a set of twins might need some additional supplement or nourishment. Also, if a lamb doesn't lay perfectly normal, so if you look at the lambs on the left here, they're, they're laying down, their legs are, their front legs are underneath them, their back legs are to the side. We see them, they look, they're laying perfectly natural. But if you see a lamb that's laying with their legs up underneath them, their rear legs, they're kind of like almost sitting like a dog on their back legs and their front legs are curled up underneath them normally. 
to me, that's also a sign of a lamb that's a little bit cold, maybe not getting enough to eat, a lamb that's in a little bit of distress. Um, I didn't actually, I tried to find a picture of, of how that lamb is laying or the description of that, and I didn't get to really truly find one here, but um, you can just tell when they don't look comfortable um, that there's something going on with them. And then lambs that stand away from the group and those lambs that don't uh, keep up with the other ones when they're running and playing. Um, I think the easiest way to tell a lamb that's falling behind is the one is the day you put down fresh bedding in your pens and it's the lamb that's not keeping up with the group or it's the one that um, isn't uh, out running around and playing are also telltale signs of, of those things that uh, say there's something not right with this one and we need to intervene. Also, some of those things to watch for with a baby lamb in order to get it started out right is, is an inverted eyelid, entropion. Um, there's multiple methods on how you can uh, treat these things and how you can repair these. You can use some eye clips. You can um, put a little stitch underneath them. You can inject them with penicillin to get that eyelid to curl out or roll out where it's not bothering that eye. Um, the books will tell you that sheep that have inverted eyelids need to be culled from your flock because uh, they will eventually breed those problems on, which I highly agree with. If you've got problems um, with inverted eyelids, you need to go through your records and make some of those decisions. But the quicker that you can get an eye inverted eyelid corrected in a lamb, the easier it's going to be. And even something as simple as an inverted eyelid can really um, hinder the progress of that lamb in terms of even seeing its mom, finding the udder. Um, if we have lambs that have inverted eyelids in the, in the jug, they always seem to struggle just a little bit more than the lambs that don't. So try to get those corrected right off the bat, record that information in your lambing records, in your lambing book, and try to uh, eliminate that from your, from your program. Um, also tail infections, where you remove the tail on your sheep, whether you're using um, uh, bands or whether you're cutting those tails off, um, crimping those tails, um, watch where that tail infection can cause some issues and cause some problems. A lot of times that infection will take hold right in that spinal column and you might even see some, some temporary uh, paralysis in some of those lambs. If you catch it early enough, you might be able to get it um, turned around using some topical treatments uh, to go over that tail um, to keep that uh, um, infection out of it, um, getting some antibiotics on board if you see that, even putting something as simple as maybe even um, blue coat or something like that on those tails to, to limit that uh, sensitive area will really help. Same thing with navel infections. Um, as much as we try to do our diligence in dipping navels and cleaning those up when they're born, we still can run into some problems on those, on those lambs with uh, those navel infections. And then the last one is injury. And if you've been around enough sheep and you've worked with plenty of sheep before, you're going to run into some of those problems where you're gonna have lambs that get hurt or lambs that get stepped on, you have a broken leg, you have some kind of other injury that they need to be tended to. They can be really a big challenge and a frustration for a shepherd, especially when you have maybe a, a lamb with a broken leg and it's a, it's a lamb and a set of twins where you have to doctor and care for that one lamb without holding up the progress of the other lamb um, in the set of twins. Um, the picture of the lamb with a broken leg there um, got stepped on in the jug here at uh, less than 24 hours old. Uh, we went ahead and set that, lamb, that leg using some padding. We get some paint sticks from our, um, like a Home Depot or a Menards, um, those wooden paint stir sticks that you would use to mix paint. They're lightweight, they're sturdy. Um, you can cut them to adjust the length that you need. And then we wrap them with vet wrap. I always like to write the date on uh, the day that lamb leg was set and know that in 10 to 14 days, we need to cut that off. And, and by writing the date on there, it uh, reminds you to keep an idea of when you do that, because many times you set a broken leg, that lamb's doing fine, you turn them out with the group and then you forget about them and, and a lot of time goes past and that cast gets pretty tight on that leg. So write the date on the, uh, on the cast and it'll help you uh, 
remember to uh, to take it off or look at it throughout the throughout the time when you're doing chores. Um, here's kind of a list of supplies of things that I always say that you should have on hand um, in order to keep your lambs going in the right direction. Um, when we get down to vet supplies, we'll talk about that just a little bit deeper. But um, the first thing I like to keep on hand is a thermometer. Um, keep that in your pocket, keep that in your, your vet room or your vet kit or whatever. It's kind of a, a tool that you can use all the time. It gives you a good indication on where you're at in terms of some problems with your sheep. Um, the temperature of fever will really give you a good indication of, of what you uh, might be dealing with. Then keep some high energy drench on hand. Baby lamb strength, survive. There's a bunch of other others out there that work if you have to get some fast energy into a lamb, whether that's a lamb that's um, a newborn or a lamb that's even just a few days old. I've even gotten to the point where I take a, a pump of some of this high energy drench and I even mix it with um, some milk replacer if I have a lamb that needs a little bit extra help. Um, we'll even add some of that right into our milk replacer and, and get that right into those babies off the bat. Keep a strong supply of colostrum on hand. If you get a ewe that has a big single and she's a heavy milking ewe, you can harvest a little bit of milk and, and either store it in, or store it in your freezer, whether you freeze it in small little freezer bags or you do it in an ice tray. Um, however you wanna store some of that colostrum, you can. There's synthetic colostrum out there that you can buy from uh, many of the uh, sheep supply companies. Or if worse comes to worse, um, I have done this and it's worked is we have a dairy unit here at NDSU as well. And I get a little bit of uh, cow colostrum as well to have on hand. So when they get a cow that's fresh, I snag a bucket from them and then store that and keep some of that cow colostrum on hand that I use as my emergency backup if I'm in a, in a pinch. Milk replacer, Kyle touched on that a lot. Um, lots of things that uh, when it comes to milk replacer, just having it on hand. Um, electrolytes are a good one to, to keep on your, um, in your vet supply as well, because if we know a lamb is hungry or needs to be assisted in terms of nourishment, he's probably also dehydrated. And more times than not, we like to jump in and try to get milk replacer in on those lambs right away. And really we should probably be getting electrolytes in them before um, to get them back hydrated before that milk replacer is going to even do any do us any good. Lamb tube and bottle and nipple, always something you should keep on hand. If you've got a warming box or a hair dryer or a heated barrel or heated box that you can bring a lamb in that gets a little bit cold, um, trying to head it off right away. If you've got a lamb that is cold at birth or maybe even it's a day old and it's in your jug, it's a little bit cold. It's amazing by putting them in a heated area for just even a couple hours how big of a difference it can make. Um, those lambs get pretty slow and uh, pretty lethargic when they get cold. And once you can get that core temperature up, it's amazing how fast they'll, they'll recover. But you can't just do that in a, an open-sided building and trying to wrap them up with towels or putting little jackets on them. You've got to have some form of outside heat. Um, same thing if you're using heat lamps in your barn. Again, I recommend that you be very, very careful when you're using those. And then when it comes to vet supplies, um, having a good uh, set of antibiotics that you can keep in your pharmacy, as I like to call it, um, that's one of those things where you need to work with your veterinarian on some of the supplies that you should have on hand. Um, simple things as an LA-200 would be good. Um, New Floor, that's, one, that's a drug that works great for respiratory. Same thing with Draxin. Uh, those are drugs that you need a, a prescription for with your veterinarian. Um, keeping something like spectamycin on hand for some of those scour type issues. Um, keeping new syringes and needles on board. I recommend when you're trying to uh, treat baby lambs to use a pretty small needle, um, using something like maybe even a 5 8 inch needle, um, 18 gauge, something like that works uh, really pretty good to have on hand to administer some of those drugs. Um, and again, even having something as simple as penicillin on board um, is good to have around, some kind of antibiotic that uh, you can get 
in these lambs if you think they've got that kind of problem. But again, building a strong relationship with your veterinarian and, and trying to uh, work through some of those problems will, will really help. And then supplies to maybe set a broken leg if um, you run into a situation where you have a lamb that gets stepped on. Um, a big component that I'm, I'm all for is record keeping. Um, record keeping is a tool that will help make so much more um, management practices and man management decisions moving forward so much easier. And if you can measure it, if you can record it, if you can observe it, I say record it. Um, how does that you act in the jug? How is that lamb's how is the lamb vigor? What's the utter quality like on that you? Were there any problems? Did you have to pull that um, lamb? Was the lamb slow to get up? You can measure some birth weights. Also record all your treatments so you know exactly what what drugs you have on board, what treatments you've been given, what vaccinations you've been get you gave your sheep. Uh, just to track that all the way through um, your flock so you can kind of pinpoint some of those problem animals, pinpoint some of those animals that might have to be called, and then that will help you in the future. And record keeping can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be. You can write your information on the side of a feed bag, or you can have a fancy spreadsheet database program that records um, all of your information and you can track it and sort it. That's really up to you. The biggest thing is just keep those records because it's amazing how much you will really actually reference those things. Because you get into a situation where a you is absolutely horrible in the lambing jug. She doesn't follow her lambs. She paws her lambs. She's not the best mother. And all of a sudden she snaps out of it. She raises a good baby and you keep her around another year and the next thing you know, she does that all over again. So if you're able to record some of that information and head the problems off, um, kind of that whole prevention uh, situation, the easier it's going to be for you as a shepherd. And then uh, the last advice, and I know this, this can be used for anything when it comes to raising livestock is keep your veterinarian's number close. So if you have to uh, call and ask some questions, but probably the best thing you can do is contact other breeders. <coughs> Excuse me. Most sheep people, most goat people, um, if they've been raising them for any amount of time, they have seen it all. There is everything from um, small problems to big problems and everything in between. So reference those people for um, any kind of information that you might need, build a strong relationship with those people. I have learned more things even today through FaceTime and video chats with other producers, um, other vet friends, other people that raise sheep. You got a problem. Hey, I'm going to FaceTime you. I'm going to send you this video. I want you to look at this picture. Technology has made shepherding so much easier um, because we can share information with people that don't have to be in the same room with us. So I highly encourage forming a sheep group, a sheep alliance, a sheep club, whatever you want to call it, um, and really lean on those people to, um, to say, hey, I've got this problem. And don't worry if you're sending them a text at two in the morning when you're checking use because they're probably doing the same thing as well. And then on the flip side to that, always be willing to help your fellow shepherds um, when situations arise. Um, if someone gives you a call, um, help them out the best you can because you never know when you're going to have to pay it forward some other time. So that's kind of uh, my spiel when it comes to lamb health. I know it wasn't super specific in terms of uh, specific situations on how you would do this or do that. Um, but again, so much of that can be prevented with uh, facilities, environment, and a keen eye as a shepherd jumping on top of those issues before they, uh, they get too bad. So Travis, that's what I've got. Um, certainly willing to take some uh, questions and, and be able to help our, our producers out. Thank you, Skip, and uh, for attendees. Now you uh, realize why it's so exciting for me to, uh, to get to work with our, our talented people of, of both uh, Skip and Kyle. We do have uh, some questions and we have an ample amount of questions and we'll get to as many as we can. I know that Kyle has actually been uh, answering some of them and others of us have been answering some of them on, on as we go in the chat box. 
Um, but Skip, I think one that is a good kind of a transition one is that you talked on the colostrum and with the, the dairy cow or, or frozen colostrum, uh, what, uh, what can we do so that we don't damage that and have it available um, and get it to those lambs quickly? Yeah, so um, you never want to microwave your colostrum. If you have colostrum stored, um, whether you're storing it in, in freezer bags or you're storing it as in an ice tray in ice cubes or something like that, put it in a bag, put it in hot water and warm it up uh, through that method, through a hot water bath, as opposed to um, microwaving it. Microwaving will do a lot of damage to the quality of the colostrum. And um, that's something you certainly don't wanna do. So hot water bath, warm it up slow, if you know you're going to um, need multiple amounts of it, um, you could probably thaw out some and then refrigerate it so you don't have to wait to thaw more of it when you're feeding that lamb at two in the morning. Thank you. And uh, when you're evaluating those with scours and you, you see that and, and now we're being reactive, um, what, what can we do or what, what's your kind of protocol or management to try to get them in the right direction. Yeah, so most of the time when we start seeing some of those scour issues, we probably also have a, a wet mouth that goes along with it. We're probably running into some kind of maybe an E. coli issue, um, get some antibiotics on board, spectomycin, um, scour halt, something it's a, uh, used for swine, it works great, it's in a red pump bottle. Um, get that on board with those lambs with, uh, with a little bit of, with a couple pumps of that. And then the other thing that I think is, is really essential is, is getting some electrolytes in those lambs as well. So start with some antibiotics, start with um, some of that scour treatment, but also um, tube them with a, a few ounces of electrolytes to get those lambs back hydrated before you um, start trying to get milk replacer or nourishment on them. When you start seeing some of those issues, again, we, we wanna help them so fast and we wanna help them so immediate that we think they're hungry. And the easiest way to do that is, is by getting um, some warm milk replacer into them. And really that's not a great environment to, to dive in with that method right off the bat. So just think of yourself, if you're, you're not feeling well, usually the last thing you wanna do is eat something. So um, put yourself in, in that situation and we gotta get them hydrated and we gotta get them feeling better before we can, we can move forward. Um, I'm going to tackle two of them at once here, Skip, since we've got you. Um, I think that can kind of get mashed in. So one of them is uh, whether um, a, a little bonus of selenium uh, as those kind of move through of a, uh, is an advantage. And the second one uh, is if and where do you get your barn lime? I know they're a little bit different, but I think you can tackle them at once. Um, barn lime, I think you can pick up at just about any feed store. Um, works great. Um, 60 pound bags, relatively cheap. Um, ground limestone, ground barn lime, uh, put it down on the floor of your pens. And then, um, yeah, selenium certainly helps if you um, know you have a problem or you're in a selenium deficient area. Um, that certainly can help. Um, giving BOCI to baby lambs, you can certainly overdose a baby lamb. So really truly read the bottle to, to know how much you're putting in. Um, a lot of times as us as shepherds, we think a lot is good, but more is better. But um, make sure you're, you're not uh, overdosing those lambs with, with BOCI if you are going to give them a little bump of, of selenium that sometimes does help. But again, it's also one of those things if you don't know where we're dealing with a selenium issue, um, we do it just to make ourselves feel good that we did something. But um, there's some telltale signs that say we might, might have some of those issues, um, but it really does, it will help to put a little bit on board. Uh, we're gonna do one more here quick and then I've got some for Kyle. And this one just came in is, uh, do you tube every lamb slash goat within the first hour? And I would presume particularly when we're getting as many as the, we do at North Dakota State University, uh, you, there'll be somewhat of a limiting factor. Now we can look at the uh, the teats and and make sure and, and look at how the lamb, uh, you know, kind of body as you said, Skip. Of them, they'll just get a little bit more gant and a little bit more hunched up, like we said. Um, but we wouldn't certainly 
prefer to use tubing as our first method. Uh, it is something that we do have. Would you touch on that just quickly? Yeah, and, and there's lots of conversations. Multiple shepherds have um, never tubed a lamb. You know, they, they look at those and um, if a lamb is up and nursing and has that sucking response and, and you strip the teats out on the ewe and she's got plenty of milk, they turn those lambs loose and let them go. I've also heard where people will milk every single ewe and they will tube every single lamb um, just to ensure that they get, you know, four to six ounces of colostrum on board right off the bat and get it into them as soon as possible. Um, that, I guess, is a production method. If you've got the time, you've got the patience, you've got the tools, um, whether you're using maybe an easy hand milker to collect that colostrum and get into them. But a lot of times we see that colostrum will come out of those ewes and it'll almost look like melted butter. And it's almost impossible to get through um, a tube just because it's so thick. Um, it's, uh, it's not very liquid at all. It's uh, almost like pudding. And sometimes you can't even do that. So I highly recommend if the lamb is strong, is up, it's vigorous, and it wants to nurse, the udder is just right, the teats are, are good size that the lamb can handle them. I say let the lamb do the work, but uh, certainly not against if you feel comfortable putting some colostrum in them manually just to ensure they get it. Thank you, Skip. Uh, Kyle, um, a couple a couple things for, for you there. I know it was brought up uh, a little bit on kind of the, the weaning ideas and you touched on it also, uh, again, that we can reiterate is that uh, you did say that we were providing Clostridium um, C and D and hopefully T for tetanus uh, as well, uh, but it was brought on uh, the delayed weaning. Uh, how do you describe that? Oh, you're on mute, kind sir. Sorry about that. I guess uh, for weaning off the ewes, I don't know, is the question, was it regarding how to dry off a ewe or uh, weaning the lambs? But um, weaning off the ewes needs to be kind of a process where you just don't think of it on a Friday and do it on a Friday. Um, it's got to be a process where you probably planned out at least seven to 10 days ahead. And um, at that time, you start deciding that uh, you're going to start uh, decreasing the amount of energy those ewes are taking in. So you'll cut back on the grain, almost to removing the grain uh, by the time you get two or three days out from weaning. Um, we start cutting back on the quality of forages. Well, while they're lactating, they get a pretty high feed value alfalfa, and then we'll cut back to a grass and eventually uh, to the lowest quality, almost straw-like um, forage that we can get uh, prior to weaning the last uh, three to five days there. Uh, we don't minimize a water or move water. I know that's a technique that, that has been used and cheap people do use that, uh, but we don't do that, uh, remove water the day of or the day after. Um, and then what that will do then is the, those lambs hopefully have been on creep feed and, and what that'll do then is those ewes start uh, drying up and, and, and the milk production starts to decrease, those, ewe lamb, those lambs will go to the creep feeder more often and more heavily. And so hopefully by the day of weaning, when you pull the lambs off the ewes, uh, those ewes are uh, in a state of uh, utter uh, dehydration and they've shrunk their udders and dried off and those lambs are uh, ready to, to be weaned and be on creep. Um, so it's not, it's got a process that's gotta be thought out ahead of time. It's, maybe what I meant to, should have said a little better, meant to say, and, and it's a process, it's gonna take uh, seven to 10 days if done right over a long time period. Thank you for the, the correct um, uh, clarification there, Kyle. And it's not just, oh, we're gonna kind of kind of let them in with the, the you here and there, um, because obviously some people may think that from a cattle standpoint. No, I, I didn't mean to make it sound like that, no. <laughs> yep. And uh, a quick clarification is that also we realize uh, that there are differences on our lamb milk replacer and our goat milk replacer. And in fact, some of those are actually in between um, that can be lamb or kid milk replacer. Uh, Kyle, do you have any input on that or it's better to be uh, species specific when given the well, option? Well, I mean, I, I think it just, uh, it maybe it'll depend on your situation. It may depend on your, 
your opportunity to even get it bought. If you live in an area where you don't have good farm stores, good feed supply companies, you may end up buying an all-purpose milk replacer that uh, you see sold that does basically every animal, you know, cats, dogs, whatever, you know. Um, but then there are milk replacers on the market. I know some of the premier brands actually are labeled for ki uh, lambs and kids. Um, and so there's good quality companies or companies that put on good quality, uh, both goat and lamb duo milk replacers, um, or you can get lamb specific as well. Um, I guess to me, my main point would be probably just to make sure you understand the labeling and you understand that if it can meet your nutrient needs of fat, protein, energy, and those things, um, that'd be first and foremost. Sometimes those all-purpose milk replacers will tend to uh, maybe cheapen up the recipe just a little bit. I like to see the first three ingredients or so to be milk-related ingredients. Um, and some of them try to maybe put uh, lesser quality ingredients in there. Um, and so I guess if, first and foremost, I would use a lamb milk replacer for lambs and a kid milk replacer for kids if you have the opportunity to buy it. And you can get get it, but if you can't, then you got to kind of go with what your available store or what your store has available. Yeah. Uh, a couple that I'll actually or can look at, but we have several questions on uh, the bloat. A couple of things that uh, was suggested was uh, the regular timing uh, of those lambs, and you know maybe that's where the the milking machines allows at least then they have access to it at any given time um, because that allows them the opportunity. One uh, individual brought in here that if it's on the bucket, cool that milk. And I think Kyle, you touched on that as well, that that warmer um, milk is something that they just want to grab and go to right away. Um, any uh, gentlemen, uh, at least we had a, several different options there on, on blow. Any other specific suggestions that you'd like to recommend? Um, for me, and to wrap it up, I think um, Skip, Skip, I think, sold or stole one of my major uh, points to students that I'm training is observation is key. Observation is everything. And part of what I try to teach the students in my course, and I think most producers should do this, is get in with the lambs, get them up, uh, Watch them, look for a stretch. I think most people don't realize it, but if a lamb gets up and stretches their back, you can feel pretty confident that they're feeling good. And, and it's easy to teach a non-sheep person in the first day of sheep production lambing class to get in the lambs, get them up. And if they stretch, you can have some assurance that they're probably feeling pretty good versus the great picture Skip showed of the hunched back lamb. You know, it's one or the other and uh, some little simple things like that. And that just goes back to observation and, and watching for things is, is vital because those lambs are fragile, they're young, they're light, they're, they're, they're new, and it doesn't take long for things to turn south if you don't catch it right away. And then if they turn south on you, it is so hard to get them back. They're just very fragile animals in the first few days of life. Well, Kyle, thanks for, uh, for your summary there. We additionally talked just a little bit about uh, the iodine dips, and so you can provide those, and that was touched on a little bit in our chat um, for those animals at their navel. And then if they potentially have an infection at a later time, at least we have some of the antibiotics, uh, if that we were to have those available uh, so that we can catch those. And I appreciate Mr. Anderson's uh, approach there uh, on, on just the valuation of those lands. And so when, when we talk about keeping the lambs and kids uh, growing and healthy and strong, uh, I appreciate both of our presenters on touching on several different uh, options uh, from either of the orphan lambs and the milk replacer to facilities and monitoring those. And so we went over a lot, but at the same time, it's, it's also then just working as a, an animal steward and working with those animals and, and Kyle, just summarize that they're very fragile and uh, that we have the opportunity to, to make a positive impact on them uh, and on those animals. And if we can get them through those, those first couple of days of that first week, and then we know that uh, Mr. Anderson has some creep feed and some soybean meal or a, mm -hmm. a 
that's in front of them. And so just think about it uh, as you move from that, you, they don't have to move from just baby food. They get to go straight to dessert, if that makes sense. Or it does in my mind, um, because then you get that creep going um, and then it, it gives them the opportunity and, and you'll see a little bit better in terms of, of quick vigor. All uh, right. And so um, the, the lambs slash kids, they tell you a lot. In fact, I know that we talked uh, just a little bit about their um, animal size at Partrition. And uh, they can be a funny thing because the big 16 pound single that that uh, that Kyle has at his place might be the most lethargic one. And the four pound Romanoff uh, that comes out with four <laughs> time is already jumping and trying to get out of the pen. And so uh, you can't base it on that. Um, but there is some certainly some heritability and in, in vigor as well. And so lots of different options. And again, we've had a lambing webinar and Claire, I believe, put that in our chat. So those uh, individuals can go to that. Um, and we look forward, we will have our next uh, webinar will be on February 18th. Uh, we're gonna have- Sorry, March 18th, today yeah. is February 18th. Here we go, yeah, yeah. We're on February, my apologies, uh, thanks Claire. We will be March 18th, uh, primarily talking about some record keeping and identification and have a very talented group of individuals. And uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, what's your last summary here? And we will uh, let individuals live the dream and go uh, check on their lambs and kids. Well, uh, I'd like to say thanks for, for having me. And uh, um, yeah, I just, I think the biggest thing is, is is spending time with your livestock. Um, I've had the great opportunity to have a lot of good mentors in the livestock business and, and the people that have the keenest eye and the sharpest eye are the best at animal health. They're the best at marketing. They're the best at promotion and they offer so much information. So um, if you're an experienced shepherd, help those new shepherds answer those questions, respond to those texts because um, we all started out as beginners at one time. So that's, I think, the biggest thing that um, I can say right now. And um, don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. Um, sheep and goats don't always read the book. You're not always going to um, have everything be absolutely perfect. So um, one thing I do tell people is if you do lose an animal or you have some situation that doesn't go to plan is to... Um, only worry about that on how you can fix it, how you can prevent it, how you can make it better. But if you stew too long on it, you're only neglecting the other ones that are still alive. So you've got to be able to move on past that one, um, make a change and uh, keep charging on, as you would say, Travis. All right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to our participants and our, our talented group. And uh, those great words of um, if, if something didn't work out on, on today's lambing or kidding, uh, learn from that and uh, take it into consideration. We've already said that you have colleagues and, and people that can help out and, and uh, help as well. And so we appreciate that very, very much and hope all is, uh, is very well with you and uh, best of wishes. Thanks so much.